Good morning, and welcome to the Energy Prospectus Group webinar hosted by Aegis Hedging Solutions. Today's topic will be an update on the U.S. natural gas and NGL markets. This event will be recorded. During the presentation, all participants will be muted. If you have any questions you would like to ask the speaker, please type them into the chat feature. We will read and answer questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now here is Dan Steffens who will introduce today's speaker. Hi, welcome everybody and uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays. Uh, uh, everything's looks, it looks a lot better since our last webinar since we've had a, a significant increase in the oil price. And we can talk about the oil price a little bit uh, during Q&A, but our topic today, we're gonna focus on the outlook for natural gas and NGL markets. Uh, Matt's got a great presentation for us. Uh, Matt is the director of market analytics for Aegis Hedging Solutions. They had a big announcement today, a merger with another hedging company, and he'll tell us about that. But uh, for me, uh, coming up with what prices I'm going to use in my uh, company valuations is one of the most difficult uh, things and controversial things, I think, that's in all of our forecast models. So this is a great topic for me. And I've learned a lot from following uh, them and listen to their webinar. So but, uh, I get uh, several emails from Aegis each day, and I regularly post their uh, morning comments under the oil and gas price update that I put on the forum each day. So you can check that out. But that's this is where they come from. Uh, Matt leads the market analytics and research development efforts at Aegis, a firm that sets up hedging programs for upstream oil and gas companies. He has 20 plus years of experience that extends across crude oil, natural gas, NGL markets, and much more. Uh, Aegis clients include producers, bankers, and trading houses. They turn to Matt for advice on how to manage their risk. And uh, we all know it's a big risk for, you know, for the upstream companies that failed to hedge properly uh, found out this last year. So I've asked Matt to focus today on the markets for U.S. natural gas and natural gas liquids, which is uh, qu quite a bit more complicated than people think. Anyway, take it away, Matt. You bet. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for all those words, too. Um, yeah, and I don't know how you handle any question and answer here, but if you have the opportunity to do it in the app, then go ahead. Um, be happy to uh, address those. Or if it's just after the fact, like if you want to uh, follow up afterwards, that'd be fine, too. Yeah, I'll um, just read them after your presentation. Great. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Yeah, Aegis is, we're a hedging advisor and um, we, we really do three things. We, we provide research to our clients uh, in the oil and gas space. That's what we're going to talk about today. We also do metals and rates and some other things, um, but we provide them research to give them insight into where prices have been and where they're likely to be going, but also a, just a, a full discussion on risk. We, we manage all of their trades um, uh, using an on, online platform. People can go and look at their valuations and get all the reports they need. And we also facilitate, tra facilitate trades by lab Federal trades with banks and swap dealers and uh, other trading houses. Um, but the big thing that you know, it's just a day for us today because um, the company Risk Revenue, who had been one of our largest, and most capable competitors, just joined us today uh, and the press releases went out. And so combined, and I don't want to misquote the numbers, but I think it's around 25% uh, of U.S. production on a BOE basis are now uh, under advisory through the combined company. So that's really cool. Um, yeah, we've won some awards. All right, so let's talk about natural gas. Uh, natural gas has been wild. Uh, in, in the, the the mild start to winter really took its toll, not in just uh, prices, but in some of the option valuations. So we'll talk about that a little bit. So the way to read this chart is that this is different parts of the forward curve. And this is the rolling prompt month in the dark blue. And then you see different parts of the curve, like the winter 2021 strip, whatever's left of it right now in the green. And then you can see like this summer coming up is in the light blue. And those are two interesting ones to look at. So as the, the price peaked out on the end of October, that was the high point and since it's been coming off and I'm going to show you that it really directly correlated with some uh, milder weather coming in. October was cold, November was extremely mild, um, just downright warm. Uh, since then, you know, since the beginning of December, we have seen a little bit of a rally, things have recovered and uh, that's really good to see. But we think that as you get out into the back of the curve, like winter 2021 here at just under $3, that that's still too cheap. It's too cheap. Uh, there's too many good things happening with both supply and demand for that to be the what we think is the fair price out there. Uh, and so there are some ways that you can uh, set your hedging program to take advantage of that if you too believe that or that a gas prices could continue to rise. 
So let's look at what happened to weather. This was the biggest thing. And uh, you know, it doesn't matter really what the supply demand balance is for natural gas in the summer, spring, and fall. During the winter, it only matters about weather. Um, you know, because if if you're looking at normal weather and suddenly you get disappointed with a mild forecast, prices are coming down no matter what happens. And uh, if it turns cold, prices are going up no matter what happens. And the reason reason is is because you got all these physical people who are buying and selling, especially on the buy side, who are having to buy gas to be able to heat homes and businesses. And if the weather turns out to be mild, then they just have too much gas and they got to sell it. And that, that's just really as simple as it is. But what we're going to see is that as we get into 2021, things we think things are going to flip. So these are just two regions in the U.S. And I'll show you the total total U.S. what happened in November. But in the, the Midwest region and the East region in the EIA, so these are HDDs, heating degree days. So it's just the difference from uh, the average temperature on the day, difference from 65 degrees. That's all it is. It's just a, it's a way to measure how, how much demand uh, th there could have been for natural gas. And so this is the, not the average line. And if it's above the line, it's above average demand. If it's below the line, it's below average. So back in October, uh, it was nice and cold. And we had above average demand in the Midwest. In the East, it wasn't as pronounced, but it was high. Look at that. Look at that drop right there. Huge drop, extremely mild start to November. And that explains why the peak was here. And then we had that, that precipitous drop in price. But what's happened uh, since then uh, it, throughout November and even in the forecast is it's you got a few days where you had some above average, but mostly it's been below average HDDs across these two regions from the Midwest to the East. All right, nationwide, what did it look like? Awful. It was just awful. So this is the temperature anomaly, so difference from normal. And unless you lived in the, you were in the pack Northwest, it was mild, exceptionally mild. In fact, if you look at the last 120 years, it was the fourth warmest November on record. Now this isn't gas weighted. This is just like, uh, you know, this is just a pop weighted thing, but uh, still fourth warmest on record. So it's hard to get a gas rally when you have that staring in in the face. But I'm going to show you that things are about to improve. So. Um, one of the other questions we get is, well, is, have traders just given up on winter uh, because it was, a, it, was a, it was a mild start to November and, um, you know, December has been okay, but it was a mild, mild November. If, if they just given up. And what I want to show you is there's something very, um, uh, you know, defensible going on in prices. So every year, uh, you start with uh, storage, you know, high in October, and then during the winter you deplete that, and then the summer is when you play catch up, and so you so you inject gas back into storage so that you'll have enough for next winter. And so at the end of winter, if you end up with low stocks, that's pretty bullish because it's going to be harder to build up your inventories for next winter. And if you start the winter, uh, you end the winter with high stocks, it's bearish because it's really easy to build that into the uh, for the next season, and uh, prices can be uh, can, need to go low so that you can um, um, uh, create some demand. That's really what's going on here. So when we started the winter, we started up around 4,000 BCF and the, the uh, scenarios that we ran were that, yeah, you could end up at about 2,300 BCF, which would be on the bearish end, but you could also end up with some cold weather down on 1,200, 1,100, 1,200, which would be bullish. And so this was the concern here. And there was a lot of uh, consensus in the market that that could happen. So what happened with that mild November? Well, we're starting from, we're going into January, so end of December, at a higher, on the high end of those inventory levels. And we now we have, we're starting with a higher level of inventory, but we also have fewer days left in winter to be able to get some cold weather. So there's fewer chances to be able to draw down that storage in a big way. And so now what are we looking at? Now we're looking at this kind of range. Well, what's been left off? All of those, uh, those, those really bullish scenarios are gone. And so one of the things that we look at when we advise clients on how to set up uh, hedge programs is uh, not, we don't just look at the price, but we also look at the uh, what we call implied volatilities or option premia, and we compare call option premia with put option premia. And uh, as a producer, if the whole market is worried that gas prices are going to go really, really high, what you see is a big premium in those call options, in a lower premium in those put options. And that's a good chance to be able to uh, sell away some of that upside price risk and you get a really good deal. Now that call premium is really gone and now the puts and the calls are really priced approximately equally. If you have questions about how that works, just send us a note, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go into more detail. So this is a big reason why the winter premium has gone away, but I'm gonna show you in just a minute why we think 20, 2021 still looks positive. 
All right, a big reason why 2021 is looking good is because of LNG demand. Uh, you probably saw in the news this summer where you know LNG demand had fallen and you know, all these cancellations, cargo cancellations. Well, we are definitely finished with that. And in fact, uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, we've seen you know 11.6 topped out 11.6 BCF a day going to LNG facilities that are earmarked for export. I mean, that's 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 a full like two BCF a day over where we averaged before uh, you know the spring before COVID. And part of that is because we've had more facilities come online. Uh, you had Cameron LNG down in Louisiana, and then most recently, uh, you could see that Chenier's uh, new train at Corpus Christi is taking more gas. And so this is doing great. Uh, and we expect it to continue. There's another LNG uh, facility that comes online probably the end of 2021. There aren't really any between now and then. But uh, we expect that utilization will be high, and this will be a major bullish factor for gas. I want to point something out because we're going to address gas basis here in a minute. On this same chart, we're also showing um, to, uh, the Cal, or the, this winter's Houston ship channel basis. And basis is just the, the price difference from Henry Hub. So it's kind of a regional differential. And we're also showing ship channel for Cal 21. Now, all of these LNG facilities are, let's just call them centered around Houston. Some of them are in Corpus Christi, south of Houston. Some of them are Freeport, just south of Houston. And some of them are over, over in Louisiana, uh, either just across the border over Lake Charles. And so it's centered around uh, Houston. And so Houston ship channel basis improves if you get that new demand. And I mean, it's it's almost one for one. You can see how ship channel basis just goes up and down depending on what LNG has been doing on a daily basis. Very interesting thing, but it's a very positive story for Houston ship channel basis and for producers who sell into that market. All right. Other thing we get asked about, and it's very important to watch, is the level of production. Of course, production has just been rising all, you know, fairly consistently since about 2009. So, uh, you know, people are always you know, thinking about, uh, you know, how is production going to affect this market? Because it certainly has up to date. Uh, but just looking over the last year in the Northeast, which is the home of the Marcellus, the Utica, you know, Appalachia base and stuff. Uh, you know, in the last year, you've touched like 33, 34 BCF a day a few times. And then uh, as uh, October would going back to October this year, you had this increase here where I've been touching about 35 BCF a day. And a lot of that was because of cheap prices during this period of time when producers were deciding to, to go out and turn some wrenches and uh, hold back gas production so that they could sell it this winter. That's part of that. Haynesville has been turning a corner and that production has been rising. That might be because of a, a pipeline that came in, uh, you know, came in, you know, like late summer, early fall. Uh, it also might be because of wells that had been drilled before and now are being completed and brought online in a higher price environment. Um, so that's something to watch there. Permian seems to be flat. It's hard to know. There's a new big pipeline that's been that's come in in the last month called Permian Highway Pipeline. Uh, it seems like gas is being rerouted onto that pipe to be able to take it to, guess where? Down towards Houston Ship Channel. And um, But we can't quite, dis the, the pipes out there is a very low, very poor sample. You think gas production out there has been flat, but it's something we're watching because we don't want to be surprised by a lot of gas that was uh, waiting for this pipe to come on. But right now, it doesn't seem to be happening. So where does that hit? Uh, how does it all combine? Well, for the lower 48, gas production in the U.S., for the, for the continental U.S., uh, you know, it had been like 94, 94. DF a day at its peak and had averaged around 94 back in Q1. Uh, well, now after all these shut-ins, lack of investment in new wells, all that, uh, gas production is up to around 90, 91 BCF a day. So year over year, you've got this deficit of maybe minus three or minus four BCF a day. So that compounds with that, that demand story I just told you, which is LNG is up three BCF a day year over year. Production's down three or four. And so you're kind of in the hole for about six BCF a day, and the market's going to start feeling that in 2021. Okay, here's a way of, of taking out the weather. So let's look at like what would have happened if you didn't have had that really, really mild November. And I could tell you it's a good story. So what we do is we do a little scatter plot here where each one of these are the weekly storage injection or withdrawal as announced by the EIA. It's every Thursday usually. And uh, right now, of course, we're in withdrawal season. So all these numbers are going to be, you know, going to be negative. And so we control for temperature by doing the scatter plot. Well, each one of the year's trend lines, you can see, you know, 2019 in the dark blue, and you got 2018 in the gray and 2017 in the, in the blue here. And recently, these red 
dots have been consistently at or below the 2017, 2018, and 20, 2019 numbers. And what that means is that uh, controlling for weather, this market is actually very tight. And if there had been any sort of cold weather at all during November, you would have seen some fireworks. And also that whenever uh, the winter weather stops to matter as much, when we get into like February and March, you strip that away. And I think the market is really going to be able to see that this uh, that we are undersupplied and we have a price problem for 2021. All right, so this is some scenarios that we ran, just thinking about like, well, if the market is tight, like how, how tight is it? And uh, it, are we gonna be able to uh, put enough gas into storage in 2021 to be able to serve next winter? I mean, is, are we gonna see like two years of really positive gas prices, really good gas prices? Uh, so back on November 3rd, we ran this and prices were a lot higher. Uh, and we were expecting that, uh, gas, that gas inventories would fall down under uh, 2000 BCF. Uh, well, what happened since then, we re-ran it on 12.7 when prices were really, really weak. And what we have there is we're starting from a higher storage level, but we still deplete down to that level, and we still have trouble building up inventories. And what that means is that the price decreases that we saw in November, the first part of, part of December, went too far. They fell too far. And whenever you did that, what you did is you picked up a bunch of implied power generation demand this summer. So prices fell too far, uh, definitely too far to uh, overcome the, uh, the demand that we lost for the first half of winter. So we really feel like that as we go into 2021, prices need to rise to be able to destroy some demand uh, and that you're very likely, uh, unless you see a lot of new associated gas production start to come on, that uh, you're going to be undersupplied going into the summer and next winter. This is another way we look at risk. Like we, we, you don't see us like talk like a, uh, you know, a lot of, let's say, bank analysts, you have a one point of view or a lot of fundamental analysts will say like, this is the way we, this is our point of view. This is what we believe. We, we're risk managers. So we're always trying to think about what are the things that could surprise us? If we look down the road six months from now, what are the things that we could look back on and say, hey, that's why uh, that's why prices went up or that's why prices went down. So that's what these are. Uh, and so we arrange these by whether they, uh, we think that they are a potential surprise. And if it's a, we think it's a potential surprise, we put it up high. And, uh, or is it, is the, does the market already know about it? Is it baked in? Is it priced in? And if, if we think it is, then we put it down low. A good example of something being priced in is COVID demand losses and the storage level. Everybody knows what the storage is. And also weather. I mean, as weather comes in, prices come down. So the good news about those things is that, yeah, they've been, they've been bearish, but they're priced in. And so uh, we have some possibilities of some surprise items to be able to lift prices in the near future. One of those is the LNG. Uh, we think that weather has had an outsized effect this winter, and uh, LNG will have a huge effect starting in um, in the spring. Dry gas production, we really don't think that uh, the market is giving that proper consideration, that there's just not enough gas coming out of the dry gas basins to offset the losses in associated gas. Uh, the one that I really want to talk about is that's relevant right now is renewables, and so let's get into that. Uh, renewables uh, are a are trouble for gas, and the reason is is because uh, whenever you build a wind farm or a solar plant, you are kicking somebody out of the market because it might be expensive to build that wind farm up front. It might be expensive to build that solar plant up front. But once you have them in place, the marginal cost of producing a megawatt from those plants is very, very low. It can be zero. It can be negative. Uh, and so that means that uh, once they're built, that you uh, and, and, and they're being utilized, you're kicking, kicking somebody out of the market. And usually what that means is that you are displacing either an inefficient gas plant or an inefficient coal plant. So what's going on here? You can see solar and wind. Solar, wind, 2020 is a huge year for renewables. About 25% about of these are already in place. Most of them are scheduled for completion at the end of the year. So we're really gonna feel it in 2021. And if we count those, you know, this is about 23 and you know, this is about 13 uh, uh, gigawatts. If that were to displace only gas, it might be you know 1.6 BCF a day of displacement, a lot. It's still going to be a lot, but it's probably going to be something like half of that, maybe like 0.8 BCF a day. But what that will do is add competition in the power generation sector uh, next year, and it will reduce the that we've hit in the last several years for power generation demand. All right.
definitely if you have questions, throw them in there. We'll talk about, but I'm gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk about regional prices. So the other thing that's happening uh, among gas producers that's really, really positive is that most of the prominent gas basis markets are priced very, very high. And that's really good because it means that producers in the Permian, in Oklahoma, in the Eastern Rockies, and some other places don't have to suffer. In, they, they, just, they don't have to suffer uh, these severe basis dislocations where their local price is super cheap. And the reason is, is because you can hedge these. So we have uh, Waha CIG, which is Eastern Rockies, and um, we have Panhandle to, for Western Oklahoma. Look at all those, right around 30 cent discount, only a 30 cent discount. It wasn't very long ago that you saw, uh, and this is for 2021, the whole year. It wasn't too long ago that Waha for the whole year was more than a dollar discount to Henry Hub. That's what you could have locked in. Right now, you can do 30 cents. If you looked at for 2022 for that whole year, same kind of story. You have uh, Waha, so West Texas, Oklahoma, and Eastern Rockies are right around there, just a little, little worse than 30 cents back or 30 cents discount to Henry Hub. So we don't think it can get a whole lot better than this. And I want to show you why. I'm going to just draw you a chart. I draw you a map. So if I start labeling these, I say, you know, Waha out in the Permian Basin, and then I got Panhandle here in Oklahoma, and I'm going to put Ship Channel because we talked about that earlier. And then CIG is up here. Let's just call it like north of Denver is kind of your CIG location. And then uh, Chicago combined, uh, joins it all together. So regionally, there's pipelines that go this direction. You know, they go like this. And uh, there's pipes that connect Waha to, to Panhandle, uh, Waha to Ship Channel in a big way now. And there's also some, some weak connections like this from Panhandle to Ship Channel. So the reason that we think Waha and Panhandle and CIG are all doing just about as good as they can do, because if Waha and Panhandle are about the same price, there's no incentive to ship gas on that, on that, that corridor. There's no, no reason to send gas north. Uh, if CIG and Panhandle are approximately the same price, then Chicago kind of is indifferent about sourcing gas from Oklahoma or, or, the, or the Rockies. And then if Waha comes, it rises to be within transportation costs of going to ship channel, then you start having people question of whether they're going to send gas that direction too. And if they stop sending gas, that reduces demand and sends prices for Waha back down. So for those reasons, we think that uh, this 30 cents is looking really, really good. Uh, it's, it's hard not to recommend uh, hedging that right now because you can lock that in. All right, let's talk a little bit about uh, hedging trends. Now, this is data from Aegis, and now that we uh, have a, with risk revenue becoming part of uh, part of the fold, this is going to become data that I think is going to be, be more and more important and a better and better sample. Uh, but let's just look at what's been happening. So if you ever look at, at announcements about what's happening with hedging, usually what you look at is from quarterly reports or annual reports from public companies, and they compile those as part of their 10Qs or 10Ks. That data is already old when you read it. It's also usually not aggregated in a way that's consistent, and so it's difficult to compare companies, and then uh, sometimes the data is just wrong. It really is. Uh, but we'll, with, uh, with us, we provide it in the same way. We have private companies, private equity backed, large public, uh, just about every kind of uh, organization you could think of. So let's look at those things. First thing I'd say is this is the number of banks and uh, other trading counterparties that have been active hedging with U.S. and or just North American oil and gas producers. And, you know, most people don't know this, but outside of just the hedging and uh, upstream industry, but when when EMPs put on hedges, they don't do it through directly through the exchange. It's almost always a bilateral agreement between the oil and gas producer and a counterparty, which is usually a bank, but it can also be another swap dealer or a, uh, or a, 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 hedge, a, a trading company. And so uh, we do business with just about all of them. And what I want to point out is that there have been news, there has been news about uh, a few banks withdrawing services from the industry and say they're not going to, you know, lend or offer services to uh, in oil and gas anymore. Um, the, the biggest one was probably BMO, BMO. And uh, they were about number five or six on our list in terms of volume. Uh, another one was AB and AMRO. That one was only about 1%. But what I want to point out is that there's 40 of them. There are a lot of counterparties out there. And if an oil and gas firm is un uncomfortable that their counterparties may withdraw from the industry, then we, they need to talk to us so that we can just get them some, uh, some um, introductions to some other counterparties that might be appropriate for them. 
There's still a lot of them left. Okay, here's some other things that happen. So this is total trade volume. This is for oil. Uh, and these columns are total trade volume that we saw in uh, for hedging. And, uh, you know, are we, uh, this is, uh, I, I smoothed this data a little bit because the last thing we want to do is to show high detail on what, on how our clients are hedging because that takes away some of their advantage, but, uh, but I, I didn't, I didn't hide the, the result. Okay. Uh, you also don't see the negative day for WTI. It's because I smoothed that price too, just to be able to compare. All right. First thing is as get oil prices really came down, you saw a lot of hedging volume right there in March. So let's just talk about it. Was that oil and gas or oil producers panicking, wanting to hedge at a low price, uh, fear? No, it wasn't. It was something really, really good. So what happened here was that uh, a lot of the uh, the hedges that were on the books among Aegis clients, you know, our average swap price was in the uh, was in the upper 50s. Our clients' average swap price was in the upper 50s. Our average put option, or like part of costless collar, was in the mid 50s. And so their hedge books were very, very much in the money. And so what a lot of them did is they monetized some of those hedges, took the cash, sometimes like $30 a barrel, and decided to repurpose that and add a different kind of hedge. And so all that volume right there, that's what you saw was people adding new hedges by monetizing what they already had. Since then, you see some things, you see these increases in hedges uh, corresponding with increases in price. So you see as prices improve, uh, people tend to add hedges and that's especially been true in November. And that's really good to see because it shows that uh, our clients are hedging at higher prices, uh, not locking in prices at the lows. All right, natural gas, you saw some similar things where you saw uh, uh, gas producers adding hedges whenever oil, gas prices were going up. But one interesting thing I thought was, and I was concerned about this, but I was proven, I was very happily proven wrong, is that the uh, a lot of the oil producers who have associated gas to hedge, they were taking those decisions separately. So they were hedging their oil at the right times, but then they were independently hedging their gas at the right times. And here's some uh, examples. As gas prices were going up during October, you could see the uh, gas volumes were rising, but oil prices were really weak. So they weren't hedging much at all. Flip to November when you had this vaccine led rally for oil and this US dollar led rally for oil. And what do you see? Oil hedges go up. Gas prices were uh, were really weak, and gas hedges were not being put on. Great to see. Uh, and then where were they putting on these hedges? What we could see is that uh, in the last 12 months, a lot of volume are being put into 2021. And this is good because with these recent rallies in both oil and gas, uh, clients have been able to catch up on their schedules and to be in good situation going into 2021. So that's the hedging trends. Um, I, that's uh, that's that data is really not available anywhere else. Uh, we're happy to be able to show you that, and we hope it helps the industry. Let's talk about natural gas liquids. Uh, the big thing driving in liquids right now is that it's low production, just like we talked about with gas. But as gross gas production just really isn't expected to rise, then uh, we have some interesting things going on with ethane, propane, and butane. So this is gross gas production forecast, and uh, this is using the Inveris, which is former drilling info. It's their uh, gross gas production. So this is gas coming off the wellhead. No processing done. It's still got all the ethane. It's got all the NGLs in it. It hasn't even been separated into Y grade. So it's just pure gas coming right off the lease. Um, according to their forecast, which includes all of the public company guidance announcements that have been made, and it also includes economics for, uh, for the companies who haven't announced, you know, they think there's going to be a slight decline going into, the tw into 2021. I think that based on the recent rise in price and some of the hedge volume we've seen, maybe just call that flat, all right? But if it's flat and you don't see, you're not expecting to see an increase in gross gas production in 2021, what that means is that for each one of these NGL components, the ethane, propane, butane, uh, natural gasoline, that the, the story, of the, the changes in the supply demand balance really happen on the demand side. So whatever happens on demand is really the thing that shifts those markets. So I'll start by taking a, look, taking a look at ethane, and this is product supplied, and that's just the EIA's way of describing demand. It's implied demand. For years, we have been waiting on a bunch of steam crackers. So these are ethylene plants. They consume ethane and they make ethylene. Waiting for these to come online. They're finicky, they're hard to build. They, they go over, uh, they, they don't stick to their original timelines for getting built, but finally they're here. And what did we see? This summer, uh, demand up close to 1.9 million barrels a day. 
Okay, fantastic. Bad news is, as soon as it came online, what happened in August and September? Hurricane Laura. So we had these storms roll through and they damaged facilities, uh, you know, they're in Louisiana and, uh, and nearby, and specifically at Lake Charles, Louisiana. And Lake Charles is the home of some, uh, some crackers right there. So direct hit and uh, caused that damage. And as soon as we had the demand, it went away. Good news about this is that those plants are, in, they're, they're, they're available and we would expect them to recover and that 2021 would be a huge demand year. The bad news is that during this, you had this happen. So this is ethane stocks, so it's just ethane inventories. And we went from being at a pretty normal level right here during, during June and July, as soon as the hurricane hit and you destroyed that demand, escalation in stocks. And so what's gonna have to happen is for, uh, you know, for the next several months, we hope it's just months, that uh, there's all these ethane stocks at Mont Bellevue that need to be worked down. And that, that big demand that we saw on the previous slide will help do that, but it's just gonna take some time. So in the meantime, uh, the market will have to hold back some of its ethane via ethane rejection to be able to keep the market balanced. And that's just gonna hold down at ethane prices for a little while. So let's talk a little bit about the ethane itself, the processing economics. And uh, Dan, we're doing good on time. I probably got it at five minutes here left. Uh, so this is ethane and uh, ethane and natural gas, and we converted we converted natural gas to dollars per mmbtu because that's the that's the decision you're making at the processing plant. So this is the ethane price. There's a nice blowout in 18. It had to do with fractionation capacity. Here's natural gas price. So you see how ethane price just bounces off of the natural gas price. Like every time it tries to touch, it bounces right off. Well, the reason is because as soon as ethane prices fall down to gas value, a processing plant has no incentive to produce the ethane. So instead of producing the ethane, they just dial back the plant and they dump all that ethane into the natural gas uh, residual line. And so it goes to the natural gas market and stays out of the market. Uh, and that's what we've seen happen several times. So recently, before the Hurricane Laura, and by the way, this gray is the, the price difference in MMBTUs uh, between ethane and gas. So before Hurricane Laura hit and you had all that demand coming in, what did you see? Ethane prices were big. You know, smiley face. They're wide, and here, uh, here was the spread between the two. Very nice spread. Hurricane Laura hits, what happens? That spread falls, ethane goes right back to natural gas levels. And then we look at the forward curve here, you can see that there's a very small spread between ethane and natural gas. So what we think happens in, in the near term, you know, this is, uh, in the near term, ethane doesn't have a real strong reason to appreciate against natural gas, but you start getting into spring and summer for ethane and you could get that, uh, that's, you could get that premium back for ethane to where it rises above natural gas. And that could be doubly bullish for ethane because ethane rises when natural gas rises. That's your first bullish indicator. Secondly, the ethane supply demand balance is getting better after you clean up those stocks. And so ethane's price could rise farther than natural gas. All right, propane and butane. This rally right here since June through current, propane, butane, uh, this is for Cal 21 and Cal 22, have risen consistently and they have risen at a faster pace, a more consistent pace, and at a higher, at a higher uh, percentage than crude has. And that's really, really good to see because, uh, like I said, this on the supply side, gross gas isn't increasing, but demand for propane and butane is because we're sending more out via exports. And this is great. All right. Um, the other thing that uh, that uh, has been really good for uh, for propane and butane is that remember about propane and butane prices is that they're influenced really by two broad things. Number one is their own supply demand balance. If if the propane or butane market's getting tighter, you're getting where demand is growing faster than supply, prices tend to rise. The other thing that influences propane and butane prices in, and C52 is the overall price of crude oil. And so as crude oil prices rise, the uh, NGL components except for ethane tend to rise too. So if you get if you get them both rising at the same time, it, it, it's doubly bullish again. So what have we seen? Here's propane historical pr prices in propane uh, for Gervin Green, and there's butane. During the last few months, see how WTI, this is WTI in dollars per barrel, per barrel, nice rally during November. During that same time, you've also seen the ratio of butane versus WTI rise too. Uh, we're going into blending season and also exports are picking up and so butane's doing really well. Propane, this may not look like a positive story with propane's ratio to WTI not going up, but keep this in mind, in the Midwest, 
is where uh, propane's demand for home and business heating is the strongest. And despite having a really mild start to winter, that ratio of propane to WTI has held in very well. And so to me, what that means is that the propane market is firm despite losing a lot of demand. And I take that as positive. So what do we think is going to happen in the future? Uh, the in contrast to ethane, where we think that the supply demand balance really has to has not yet manifested in price for late for like mid to late 2021 for propane and butane, it seems we had a really good rally that does reflect a lot of this demand and it would be a good time to hedge into that strength and perhaps wait on the ethane. So that's my uh, that that's uh, the quick drive through natural gas and natural gas liquids and some hedging trends. And I hope I've left a little bit of time here just in case uh, we want to follow up on any point or go any deeper or even talk about uh, any crude elements. Dan, how's that sound? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, great presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, we do have some questions here. Can you see the chat box? Let me take a look. It's probably down. At the yeah, bottom. I can. Yeah, okay. Uh, why don't we go on those first? And I've got some questions that uh, some people emailed to me. But uh, Christina, which is one of our women members and very smart lady, uh, sends this qu uh, question. Great presentation. Says, Setting aside renewables, are there any other long-term demand drivers for uh, natural gas in the next 36 months? And then she points out, uh, what about the potential to increase for blue hydrogen, which I've gotten questions on that too. Oh yeah, like uh, using like natural gas for to make hydrogen and fuel yeah, cells. Yeah. So I don't think that's a near-term thing. Um, the 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 bigger the bigger near-term risks I would point out is like we talked about LNG as being a positive story. It could very it could very well be a threat too. And now uh, we send LNG. Our, our primary markets that we need to be concerned about is like you take U U.S. LNG, so you take natural gas, liquefy, put it on a ship, and then you send it. Uh, the markets that we need to be concerned about are going to be Europe uh, or Asia. Asian markets are going crazy right now. Asia LNG prices are super high, and uh, so high that there's rumors that you're actually destroying some demand over there. And part of the reason it's high is not just because they need the material, but also because tanker rates are extremely high. Um, and so if you look on paper at that arbitrage, that export arbitrage between the U.S. and Asia and the U.S. and Europe, it looks wide open. But what we saw this, this, this year, and granted 2020 was an exceptionally weird year, uh, but what we saw this year was that uh, the U.S. LNG shippers are vulnerable to cancellations. And so one of the things that I would be concerned about is that once we get into spring and maybe early summer, that a combination of some LNG um, um, uh, maintenance events and also uh, maybe Europe or Asia not wanting as much material, you could see demand fall. Uh, other items on the gas uh, regarding demand. Um, you know, I feel like the de de demand is a lot stickier with natural gas. Uh, power is elastic, so it depends on price and it also depends on this renewables. But in general, domestic natural gas demand is, uh, is fairly sticky and, and elastic. So I wouldn't be as concerned there. And um, LNG would be a main one. Let's see what else we got. Yeah, how, how do coal prices uh, impact? Yeah, when, when does it become, I mean, if gas goes to $4 or $5, mm -hmm. and what does that do? Does that bring more coal back? Yeah, it does. And it, I mean, it's happened in the last couple of months where you've seen people switch. People, some people think that that coal to gas switching is, you know, an old story and it doesn't happen anymore. Uh, it's not true. It happens and it happens over the course of you know weeks, not not months. Uh, those, those choices yeah. are changed. Uh, for that question, it really depends on what kind of coal and what market you're in. Right. So, um, you know, take Texas, for example, where we get a lot of, of coal from uh, the Powder River Basin. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a poor coal, uh, it has to be shipped here, but it's also a cheap coal. And so that's direct competition with uh, where uh, if Texas regional gas prices fall below the delivered cost of PRB, we pick up a lot of demand. In the East, uh, you're, you're tied more to like Appalachia coals, so more expensive coals, higher quality coals. Um, and so they just have different break evens. But by our, our analysis, you should think of it as a continuum. There's this gap between probably around uh, 225 gas and 270 gas where you don't do a lot of switching, but then when you get over 270, uh, you start losing demand more and more and more as prices escalate into the $3. Yeah. 
I mean, it's good to have it though for the source because we got to have electricity. That's for sure. Uh, uh, you showed that one chart where you had a big increase in 2021 for wind and solar capacity coming online, but then it yeah. kind of drops off for 22 and 23. So how do you explain that? Oh, I think somebody, I think you've got an expert in your, in your, <laughs> in your listeners, because that's a really insightful question. So if you were to go in and get this data from EIA, it wouldn't look like that chart. And the reason is because we only included the, uh, the wind, solar and gas plants that were actually under construction. Like if you haven't broken ground, we didn't count it uh, because we didn't wanna just think, oh, somebody's got a, uh, you know, has a permit out there, but they actually haven't started on the project. That's why. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I don't think it's as big of a threat as people think. <laughs> I think uh, those wind and they're not free. They don't grow free. The, the energy from the sun and wind might be free, but the facilities themselves are very, very expensive and require. They are. And they, they're also intermittent. Yeah. And sure. um, that, that's one of those things where gas just really has an advantage against coal, um, you know, until they find out a way to store energy large scale, you know, yeah. in places that don't have, yeah. Until they figure out how to store energy in large scale at uh, reasonable prices, then uh, gas has a role to play in filling that intermittent style. Yeah, I, I, uh, I read an article and it said any state that's going to get over 20% of their electricity from wind and solar is almost surely going to have regular brownouts. <laughs> They're going to have difficulty unless they got a lot of backup gas fired power plants sitting around. So, well, that would put anyway. a dent in my, uh, in my zoom career. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, okay, what's the difference in demand in uh, European LNG and Asian LNP uh, right now? I know they're they're competing for supply right now. Yeah, so LNG uh, into Asia is definitely a part of the future, and um, it, it's been named several times as a as a fuel that will just keep on. There will be more and more demand for it. It's clean. Uh, it replaces coal very well. Uh, it's fairly portable. You know, it's just it's a it's a really good fuel. Um, for Europe, it's a little bit more of a threat. You're not talking about you know, most of the European economies are you know well developed, and um, their energy use per capita or per GDP unit isn't growing very fast, and so it's not as big of a uh, of a growth uh, you know growth market for LNG. The other thing that affects European LNG is that you know, Russia is trying to complete a pipe, a uh, big pipe, uh, called Nord Stream Two. Um, uh, into Germany soon, and that would allow more Russian gas to flow into uh, into Germany or into Northwest Europe, and that would likely displace LNG cargoes. So th those are the big reason things there, where Europe has more of a near-term threat uh, from uh, Russia gas, while Asia still has an appetite. You know, this next question is about associated gas and mo probably coming more from the Permian than anywhere else, and I'm sure some up in North Dakota, but. Um, you know, that's what really drove down gas prices last year was all this associated gas coming online. But is most of that now online? Is there, is there a lot still being flared that could, could come and, you know, hurt the market for gas or bring too much supply online? Such a great question. I don't know the answer. And, um, you know, whenever, what was it, a year ago, I think, that um, Gulf Crossing or was it called the Gulf Coast Express came online mm -hmm. and that another big uh, Permian gas pipeline that was about a year ago I think and that time you could tell through some of the price signals out there and also through some regulatory filings that uh, the, the gas flaring was huge and there, there was all this gas that was likely to want to flow to market just as soon as a pipeline was available this time because remember that chart I showed with Permian gas you mm -hmm. know declining this year and kind of flattening out right now this time it's not so clear. And uh, we didn't think that there was the much flared gas sitting back, you know, behind the scenes wanting to flow to market, you know, this bonus supply, uh, but we were concerned about it. And, and so far what it seemed to happen is when you had this big, uh, this Permian Highway pipeline that's, you know, ha has come online and, you know, is, is starting, you know, starting up service. So far, it doesn't seem like production is rising out there uh, to fill that line. Mm -hmm. So uh, for now, it doesn't seem like there's extra flared gas that's going to surprise us. But well, and they're under and the public. They're under a lot of pressure to get that gas online. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you, Raymond James and their uh, gas price forecast of about four or five weeks ago, I think uh, they literally have a statement that associated gas is going to drop off a cliff. 
like in the first quarter, they expect a big uh, decline in associated gas. Yeah, well, I'd say our, our producers aren't, we're not seeing that revision in their production forecast yet in aggregate, um, for sure, some of them. Yeah. And uh, some, some I would expect that, you know, PDP declines would continue and without new drilling that, uh, you know, that we keep falling. Uh, I think that we're in a unique position to see a broader sample than what's generally available in the market. And we're not seeing wide, you know, uh, large scale redu reductions in gas production forecasts going into next year. Yeah. Some have already happened, of course, but not new ones. I, I saw something also that uh, there's some uh, guesstimates that the Marcellus may be peaking. That we've got so yeah. many wells online now, you, you're going to have to drill and complete a lot of wells just to hold production flat. Well, you know, and even not not you're taking this another way, thinking about what the potential production could be uh, before you start destroying local prices, is that you know I showed that chart that showed that uh, Northeast production had you know, touched 33 or 34 BCF a day a few times in the past, and then this year during October rose up to 35. If for those of you who watch, who watch regional prices, Northeast regional prices were destroyed this fall. And uh, a lot of that was because of that growing production. And so if you take that market signal, it shows that whenever you have a little bit more supply and local prices fall that much, then the Northeast might be limited by uh, two things. Number one is that those who have outbound transportation could maintain their volumes but it doesn't leave a lot of extra room to grow because the only pipe that's being planned is one that is still facing trouble getting, uh, you know, getting placed into service, approach. legal trouble, it's Mountain Valley Pipeline. And when that's in place, yeah, you do raise the, uh, the potential, uh, maybe by two BCF a day, but then there's not another pipe, a pipeline planned. And so there's, there's somewhat of a price cap that could happen there to keep production uh, from growing. Yeah, and you know, I follow Antero Resources and Range and EQT. And the one thing is those guys have so much of their production now held, held uh, so much of their leasehold held by production. They're not under a lot of pressure to keep drilling new wells all the time. So I'm sure they're watching the market real carefully. Oh, why are we going to drill wells if it's all it's going to do is hurt our overall gas price? Um, so I hope. Well, one thing that we didn't that. talk about, and, and, and this might be a good place to, you know, to, to wrap it up, is that we didn't talk about oil. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, w w the gas market needs to watch oil price very, very carefully, because now that oil prices are close to $48, I didn't check it out before I came in here, but close to 48 and the oil curve is also fairly flat, meaning that uh, it makes it easier to hedge uh, 2021, 2020, 2022 prices. That means that we are getting close to some price thresholds where oil producers are going to take a serious look at putting in new growth capital. And if that's the case, then associated gas production could start to rise when producers start seeing $50 oil. Yeah. I mean, I, I do know that these boards are under tremendous pressure <laughs> to repair their balance sheets and start returning some cash to their investors. So I don't see a big slug of new drilling until, you know, if we're firmly above 50, then I think that there's a risk that that could happen true, but it's now get, get, that oil prices, higher oil prices is actually kind of a negative for gas. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So that's it. Uh, well, my hope, and we can wrap it up now is that it, if LNG, um, you know, demand starts to you know, drop off a little bit when we get to late spring and summer, I'm hoping by then that industrial demand starts really picking up as our U S economy gets out of pandemic prison and can move on <laughs> and we just uh, you know get back to a regular world again so anyway well matt thank you very much uh we'll end it there and uh anybody that's listening if you have other questions and you want to email them right to me or to energy at gmail.com just go ahead and i can forward them on to matt uh thanks again